So what I'm going to be talking today about is navigating the future of AI augmented software engineering. One of the things about this course is we try to look at different disciplines and take a broad view of how you can apply generative AI to different kinds of topics, and different kinds of fields. So we're going to focus on software, and that's the type of courses I teach here at Vanderbilt. I'm going to be focusing not just on teaching, however, but I'm going to be talking more about how people conduct research on software engineering in order to make the systems we build be more economical, more reliable, more secure, more effective, and so on and so forth. And what we're going to do to start out with is I'm going to give you an overview of the dimensions of AI augmentation for software. And I'll explain the different concepts as we go through this. This material, as we'll see in a second, is based in some degree on a study that was published a couple years ago by the Software Engineering Institute, funded by the National Science Foundation and DARPA, and in collaboration with those organizations and so on. So we'll be talking about that as well as a guiding principle. You can read this study if you go here. It's really quite fascinating, at least to me. So in November of 2021, we released a study that was designed to show how the future of software engineering would be conducted, the types of research, the types of development that was going to be needed in order to build the next generation of software-reliant systems. It should hopefully come as no surprise to people that software is eating the world, as Mark Andreessen likes to say. And that was true 10 years ago. It was probably true 20 years ago, too. But it certainly was true 10 years ago. It's true today. More and more things we deal with are software-enabled. Almost everything we do has some relationship to software. Even the hardware that we develop and use is built by software modeling tools and so on. So this was a project that was done in conjunction with DARPA, NSF, and the Software Engineering Institute. And I was a co-author of this report. The report was attempting to codify the research roadmap and research agendas, research objectives for software research. I'm not going to go into great detail about all these different pieces because I just want to focus on the ones that have to do with AI. But if you're interested, you should read the report. Now, there's a great quote which is attributed to either Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, or Yogi Berra, the famous baseball player and manager of the Yankees, which is, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And what was interesting about this particular report we put out was we were trying to look 10 to 15 years down the road. So what was going to happen in 10 to 15 years? And one of the key themes in the report, which is very relevant to this course, is that the way we currently build software, which is very manual, we use some automated tools, but it's very much people doing all the work, is going to be replaced where, with a, a pipeline where people, humans, and AI augmented stuff, methods, processes, tools, techniques, and so on, will work together as trustworthy collaborators that can rapidly evolve systems based on the intent as opposed to just the programming, which is the way it's largely done today. So that was kind of the vision. What was fascinating about this is, remember, we were looking 10 to 15 years down the road. Almost exactly a year later, November 2022, ChatGPT escaped from the lab. So if you know much about the history of generative AI, there, of course, had been work going on for quite some time up to the point where ChatGPT was released. But it came out in this time frame. And uh, this allows us to be able to do generative AI. What is generative AI? Hopefully, you know this by now because you've been taking the course. It's essentially a way of being able to create models or systems that can be used to synthesize what appears to be new and original content, which, of course, is an amalgamation of many other things. But at least from the point of view of the people who are using it, it appears new, it appears creative, it appears original. So this is all very cool. But then people started to get worried. So if you take a look over the past eight months or nine months, however long it's been since ChatGPT really took the world by storm, there's lots of gloom and doom. There's a damn good chance AI will destroy humanity. The AI apocalypse is coming. Should we stop developing AI for the good of humanity? Is AI the end of the world? And in the immortal world, words of Ron Burgundy from Anchorman, that escalated quickly, right? So people have decided it's the end of the world. Now, I'm not going to spend much time talking about whether it's the end of the world or not. I don't think it's the end of the world. But if it was to be the end of the world, then we wouldn't have to think much about predicting the future of anything, right? Much less software engineering or AI engineering or otherwise. There's a great quote by Kurt Vonnegut from one of his books, famous sort of existential writer from World War II and beyond. It said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? So if it's the end of the world, then who cares? 
Of course, there's also a corollary quote by Dorothy Parker who said something to the effect, but alas, we never do. So we're probably gonna have to figure out how to deal with this influence and influx of AI-enabled, AI-augmented stuff one way or another. So the study that we did covered six research focus areas. Like I said, I'm not gonna focus on more than just a couple. I'm gonna focus on the two areas in the study that dealt with AI augmentation. And the two areas of AI augmentation the study dealt with at the time, keep in mind this is like three years ago, what, or two years ago, 2021, AI augmented software development, that means using tools to build systems that, that use AI techniques. We'll talk a bit more about what those would be in a second. And then also engineering AI enabled software systems, building systems whose operation is, uses artificial intelligence. So those are the two main areas and that's what I'm gonna focus on in my talk. Now it turns out since we wrote the report a couple years ago, we thought about this a lot more carefully and realized that there's really a, a broader taxonomy. And I wanna just briefly describe this because this will give you a sense of the rest of the talk. So there's two dimensions of this axis, these axes. One is the x-axis, which is degree of augmentation in the software development life cycle or the SDLC. And without boring you with too much detail about what that means, that means the methods, the processes, the tools, the techniques, the programming languages and so on that we historically use to build software. And back in the day, up till very recently, those were not AI augmented, they were whatever they were. And now they're getting increasingly AI augmented. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. The other axis here is degree of AI augmentation for system operations. That means does the system use AI when it's running, not when we're developing it, which is kind of ahead of time, but when it's actually operating. And once again, we have low, you know, not using AI at all. Most, most systems don't do much AI or have not done much AI in the past, up to very high augmentation. So let's take a look at some examples. So conventional stuff, like almost everything that you use day in and day out was built without using AI techniques to build the software and doesn't use AI techniques when the software runs. So if you think, for example, about your, your iPhone or your Android device, the vast majority of the software running in one of these devices was not developed with AI techniques, and it's not really using AI techniques when it runs either. And that's true of many, many, many things. I would say you know 99% of all software wasn't built with AI and doesn't use AI at runtime. So that's, that's kind of the status quo, that's the baseline. This part of the quadrant, so this quadrant is getting to use AI augmented tools to build conventional systems. So an example might be, you're going to host a website and you're gonna deliver content, but you're going to use various AI enabled or AI based code generators. You might generate code using ChatGPT. You might also generate code with in integrated in development environments like IntelliJ or Android Studio that uses AI to help you generate the code or comment the code. You might do code reviews based on AI augmented tools that can give you feedback on whether you're doing a good job. You could use unit tests or regression tests that are AI generated and so on and so forth. So that's another part of the space. We're gonna talk a bit more about this in a second. Another part of this quadrant, another quadrant is AI augmented system operations, but built using conventional software development techniques. So a good example would be the types of recommendation engines that you use when you go to places like Amazon or YouTube or pretty much anything where they give you recommendations. You could have a recommendation engine on some e-commerce platform that uses machine learning to figure out how to map your interests and your profile and your history and your demographics and your location and so on to give you recommendations. But the software itself is developed using conventional agile methods. So no, no AI really there. That's, that's something we see a lot too. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Of course, the pinnacle, the, the holy grail of all this is AI augmented systems built using AI augmented techniques. So you might have a self-driving car system that uses machine learning algorithms to navigate and decide whether you're going to go through a stop sign or a stoplight, or you're going to hit uh, another car or whatever. And it could use some AI driven DevOps, which is development and operation tools for deploying, for developing, testing, and deploying software. We're not going to talk much about this upper quadrant, although this is indeed the future, but it's a little, little bit down, further down the, the way. So that's the end of the first part of the discussion about AI augmented software engineering, just giving you a sense of the landscape. 